The Mummy, 1999 film, from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. The Mummy is a 1999 American action-adventure film written and directed by Stephen Summers. It is a remake of the 1932 film of the same name, starring Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weisz, John Hanna, Kevin J. O'Connor, and Arnold Vosloo in the title role as The Reanimated Mummy. The film follows adventurer Rick O'Connell as he travels to Hamanaptra, the city of the dead, with a librarian and her older brother, where they accidentally awaken Imhotep, a cursed high priest with supernatural powers. Development of the film took years, with multiple screenplays and directors attached. In 1997, Stephen Summers successfully pitched his version of a more adventurous and romantic take on the source material. Principal photography took place in Morocco and the United Kingdom. The crew endured dehydration, sandstorms and snakes shooting on location in the Sahara Desert. Industrial light and magic provided many of the visual effects, blending live-action footage and computer-generated imagery to create the titular monster. Jerry Goldsmith provided the orchestral score. The Mummy was theatrically released on May 7th, 1999. Despite mixed reviews from critics, it was a commercial success and grossed over $416.4 million worldwide against a production budget of $80 million. The film's success spawned two direct sequels, The Mummy Returns, 2001, and The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, 2008. It also led to spin-offs, such as an animated series, and the prequel, The Scorpion King, 2002, which generated its own sequels. Attempts to reboot the property and kickstart a new media franchise led to a 2017 film. Section 1. Plot. In Thebes, Egypt, 1290 BC, High Priest Imhotep has an affair with Raksunamun, the mistress of Pharaoh Seti I. Imhotep and Aksunamun kill the pharaoh after he discovers their relationship. Imhotep flees while Aksunamun kills herself, believing that Imhotep can resurrect her. Imhotep and his priests steal her corpse and travel to Hamanaptra, the city of the dead. The resurrection ritual is stopped by Pharaoh's bodyguards, the Medjai. Imhotep is buried alive with flesh-eating scarab beetles and locked in a sarcophagus at the feet of a statue of the Egyptian god Anubis. The Medjai are sworn to prevent Imhotep's return. In AD 1926, Jonathan Carnahan presents his sister, Evelyn, a librarian and aspiring Egyptologist, with an intricate box and map that lead to Hamanaptra. Jonathan reveals he stole the box from an American adventurer, Rick O'Connell, who discovered the city while in the French Foreign Legion. Evelyn and Jonathan find Rick and make a deal with him to lead them to the city. Rick guides Evelyn and her party to the city, encountering a band of American treasure hunters, led by Rick's cowardly acquaintance, Benny Gabor. Despite being warned to leave by Ardeth Bay, leader of the Magi, the two expeditions continue their excavations. Evelyn searches for the Book of Amun-Ra, made of pure gold. Instead of finding the book, she stumbles on Imhotep's remains. The team of Americans, meanwhile, discover the black Book of the Dead, accompanied by canopic jars carrying Anaxuna Moon's preserved organs. At night, Evelyn reads from the Book of the Dead aloud, accidentally awakening Imhotep. The expeditions return to Cairo, and Imhotep follows them with the help of Benny, who has agreed to serve him. Imhotep regenerates his full strength by killing the members of the American expedition and brings the Ten Plagues back to Egypt. Rick, Evelyn and Jonathan 
meet our death at a museum. Our death hypothesizes that Imhotep wants to resurrect Anaxina Moon by sacrificing Evelyn. Evelyn believes that if the Book of the Dead brought Imhotep back to life, the Book of Amun-Ra can kill him again, and deduces the book's whereabouts in Hamanaptra. Imhotep corners the group with an army of slaves. Evelyn agrees to accompany Imhotep if he spares the rest of the group. Although Imhotep does not honour his word, Rick and the others fight their way to safety. Imhotep, Evelyn and Benny return to Hamanaptra, pursued by Rick, Jonathan and Ardeth, who are able to locate the Book of Amun-Ra. Imhotep prepares to sacrifice Evelyn, but she is rescued after a battle with Imhotep's mummified priests. Evelyn reads from the Book of Amun-Ra, making Imhotep mortal, and he is fatally wounded by Rick. Imhotep vows revenge. Benny accidentally sets off a booby trap while looting the city of its riches and is killed by a swarm of flesh-eating scarabs as Hamanaptra collapses into the sand. Our death bids Rick, Evelyn and Jonathan goodbye, and the trio rides away on a pair of camels laden with Benny's treasure. Section 2. Cast. Brendan Fraser as Rick O'Connell, Rachel Weiss as Evelyn Carnahan, John Hanna as Jonathan Carnahan, Arnold Vosloo as Imhotep, Kevin J. O'Connor as Benny Gabor, Jonathan Hyde as Dr. Alan Chamberlain, Odid Fair as Ardeth Bay, Eric Avari as Dr. Terence Bay, Stephen Dunham as Isaac Henderson, Corey Johnson as David Daniels, Took Watkins as Bernard Burns, Omid Jalili as Warden Gad Hassan, Aharon Ipale as Pharaoh Seti I, Bernard Fox as Captain Winston Havelock, Patricia Velasquez as Anaxina Moon. Section 3 Production. Section 3.1 Origins. In the late 1980s, producers James Jacks and Sean Daniel decided to update the original 1932 Mummy film for the modern era. Universal gave them the go-ahead, but only if they kept the budget around $10 million. Jacks remembers that the studio essentially wanted a low-budget horror franchise. In 1987, George A. Romero wrote a film treatment and was attached to direct Screenwriter Abby Bernstein recalled that Universal Studios wanted an unstoppable mummy, akin to the Terminator. Bernstein's story took place in the present. Scientists inadvertently bring a mummy to life, who wants to use an ancient device to destroy all life on Earth. The mummy had no more social interaction than the T-Rex did in Jurassic Park, Bernstein recalled. Romero drifted away from the project and the script was abandoned. Next, Jax and Daniel recruited horror filmmaker slash writer Clive Barker to direct. Barker's 1990 treatment and a successive 1991 screenplay by Mick Garris were dark and violent, with the story revolving around an art museum that rebuilds an entire Egyptian tomb in Beverly Hills. Jax recalls that Barker's take was dark, sexual, and filled with mysticism, and that it would have been a great low-budget movie. Barker recalled the concept was too weird for the studio, and that his vision treated the mummy as a jumping-off point for the film, instead of the central character. Alan Ormsby, unaware of previous efforts to launch the film, was brought on next. Ormsby pitched a more straightforward update to the 1932 film, again focusing on the mummy as a relentless Terminator-like character. Joe Dante was attached as director, increasing the budget for his idea of Daniel Day-Lewis as a brooding mummy. 
This version's draft was later rewritten by John Sayles. It was set in contemporary times and focused on reincarnation, with elements of a love story. It came close to being made, with some elements, like the flesh-eating scarabs, making it to the final product. But Universal balked at the higher price tag. George A. Romero returned to the project in 1994, with a vision of a zombie-style horror film similar to Night of the Living Dead, but which also relied heavily upon elements of tragic romance and ambivalence of identity. Romero completed a draft in October 1994, co-written with Ormsby and Sales, that revolved around female archaeologist Helen Grover and her discovery of the tomb of Imhotep, an Egyptian general who lived in the time of Ramesses II. Unfolding in a nameless American city in modern times, events are set into motion when Imhotep inadvertently awakens as a result of his body having been exposed to rays from an MRI scan in a high-tech forensic archaeology lab. Helen finds herself drawn into a tentative relationship with Imhotep, while also experiencing clairvoyant flashbacks to a previous life in the 19th dynasty of Egypt as a priestess of Isis. Summoning mystical powers through incantation, Imhotep later resurrects the mummy of Karis, a loyal slave. Karis embarks on a vengeful rampage against the grave robbers of his tomb. Romero's script was considered too dark and violent by Jax and the studio, who wanted a more accessible picture. Romero was unable to extricate himself from another contract he had in negotiation with MGM, and so his involvement with the film was severed, and the development of an entirely new script was commissioned. Mick Garris returned in 1995, developing a script that combined elements of the 1932 film and 1942's The Mummy's Tomb. This draft was a period piece, a wash in Egyptian art-inspired art deco, but the vision once again proved too expensive for the studio, and was discarded for a modern setting. While the project came close to entering production, Universal was sold to Seagram. Scheinberg chose to produce The Mummy through his independent company and write a new script. Unable to find a suitable high-profile writer and director, Wes Craven was offered the film but turned it down, the project unravelled again, and Garris left the project for the second time. Still determined to create a new mummy film, in 1996 Universal hired Kevin Jar to write a new screenplay. According to Jax, the executives were now convinced that the film should be a larger budget period piece. Stephen Summers called Jackson Daniel in 1997 with his vision of the mummy as a kind of Indiana Jones or Jason and the Argonauts, with the mummy as the creature giving the hero a hard time. Summers had seen the original film when he was eight and wanted to recreate the things he liked about it on a bigger scale. Discussing other classic horror characters, Summers recalled that Frankenstein made me sad. I always felt sorry for him. Dracula was kind of cool and sexy, but the mummy just plain scared me. He had wanted to make a mummy film, but other writers or directors were always attached. After the box office disappointment of Babe, Pig in the City and other films, Universal needed a hit film. At the time, Universal's management had changed in response to the box office failures, and the losses led the studio to revisit its successful franchises from the 1930s. New chair, Stacy Snyder, distributed packets detailing the studio's holdings, including nearly 5,000 old scripts and films. Summers received his window of opportunity and pitched his mummy to Universal with an 18-page treatment. Summers did not want to remake the original film, Instead of making another straight horror movie, he wanted to turn it into a romantic adventure with horror elements. Conscious of how the shambling, bandaged mummy of the old films had become something of a punchline, he wanted a faster, meaner and scarier monster. 
Summers incorporated his own research and the services of a UCLA archaeology professor to make the ancient Egyptian language accurate. Snyder recalled that Summers' treatment was unique in that it took place in the 1920s rather than a contemporary setting. Universal liked the treatment so much that they approved the concept and increased the budget, and Summers spent a year working on the screenplay. Section 3.2 Casting Producer James Jacks offered the role of Rick O'Connell to Tom Cruise, who was later cast in the reboot film, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. But the actors were not interested or could not fit the role into their respective schedules. Jax and director Stephen Summers were impressed with the money that George of the Jungle was making at the box office and cast Brendan Fraser as a result. Summers also commented that he felt Fraser fit the Errol Flynn swashbuckling character he had envisioned for Rick perfectly. Fraser's turn in George bolstered his perceived star power, yet he remained far cheaper than the biggest actors working. The actor understood that his character doesn't take himself too seriously, otherwise the audience can't go on that journey with him. Evelyn Carnahan was named in tribute to Lady Evelyn Carnarvon, the daughter of amateur Egyptologist Lord Carnarvon, both present at the opening of the Tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922. The studio originally considered American actresses, and Rachel Weiss auditioned multiple times before getting the part. Rachel Weiss was not a big fan of horror films, but saw the movie as more of a hokum comic book. John Hanna was picked for the role of Jonathan Carnahan, despite the fact that Hanna felt he was not a comedic actor. Said Summers, he had no idea why we cast him. Jax had previously produced Hard Target with Arnold Vosloo. The South African actor liked the mummy script, but told Summers he wanted to play the role absolutely straight. From Imhotep's point of view, this is a skewed version of Romeo and Juliet. He was offered the role after a single audition. Carrying some extra weight, and conscious of it because of Imhotep's skimpy costume, Voslo lost 10 to 15 pounds for the role by eschewing alcohol and sugar. Section 3.2 Filming Filming began on May the 4th, 1998, and lasted 17 weeks. The crew could not shoot in Egypt because of unstable political conditions, so principal photography began in Marrakesh, Morocco. Marrakesh had the extra advantage of being a much less modern city than Cairo, making it easier to dress like the 1920s. The production set up two weeks before filming, taking down telephone wires and cables and shipping in period cars and camels, Locals served as extras for crowd scenes. After shooting in Marrakesh, filming moved to the Sahara Desert, outside the small town of Erfoud. Production designer Alan Cameron found a dormant volcano, Garamedua, where the exteriors for Hamanatra could be constructed. A concrete ramp was built to allow access into the horseshoe-shaped formation, where the city was built from prefabricated parts shipped from England. A survey of the volcano was conducted so that an accurate model and scale models of the columns and statues could be replicated back at Shepperton Studios, where all of the scenes involving the underground passageways of the City of the Dead were shot. These sets took 16 weeks to build, and included fibreglass columns rigged with special effects for the movie's final scenes. To avoid dehydration in the scorching heat of the Sahara, the production's medical team created a drink that the cast and crew had to consume every two hours. Sandstorms were daily inconveniences, and wildlife were a major problem, with many crew members having to be airlifted to medical care after being bitten or stung. Brendan Fraser nearly died during a scene where his character is hanged. The production had the official support of the Royal Moroccan Army, and the cast members had kidnapping insurance taken out on them. After shooting in North Africa, production moved back to the United Kingdom before completion of shooting on August 29th, 1998. 
Here, the dockyards at Chatham doubled for the Giza port on the Nile River. This set was 600 feet, 183 metres, in length, and featured a steam train, an Ajax traction engine, three cranes, an open two-horse carriage, four horse-drawn carts, five dressing horses and grooms, nine pack donkeys and mules, as well as market stalls, Arab-clad vendors, and room for 300 costumed extras. Section 3.3 Special Effects The filmmakers reportedly spent $15 million of the budget on special effects alone. The Mummy features hundreds of shots that required optical or digital special effects in post-production. Effects House, Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, contributed more than 140 shots to the film, with additional work done by Cinecit, 60 shots, and Pacific Title Mirage, 45 shots and the film's title sequences. Summers engaged ILM while still developing the script, having previously worked with ILM effects supervisor John Andrew Burton Jr. on Deep Rising. ILM was eager for the challenge the film provided, and produced a proof of concept for The Mummy's effects in late 1997 to demonstrate the feasibility of Summers' vision to executives. The filmmakers sought to make something faster and scarier for the title creature, using cutting-edge techniques to create something never before seen. ILM started developing the look of The Mummy three months before filming started. We wanted to create a photorealistic corpse that was obviously not a man in a suit, obviously not an animatronic, and obviously alive, he recalled. Over a months long period, the designers worked on developing four distinct stages for the mummy. Stage one was the mummy at its most decayed, with tattered bits of clothing, skin and sinew hanging over a skeleton. Stage two added areas of regenerated skin, with stages three and four having the mummy almost fully regenerated, with only small areas of its innards showing through. The artists developed black and white sketches, then moved on to colour treatments, before building the creature in the computer. Models were also made to use as reference for the digital artists. The initial states of the mummy were created entirely by computer, while later stages combined live-action performance. To supplement prosthetics and makeup supplied on set, LED lights and pieces of tape served as tracking points so that digital cutouts could be applied to Vosloo's face and body in post-production. Vosloo remarked that walking around the set, he felt like a Christmas tree. The final creature was created with a combination of live-action acting with prosthetics and digital imagery. A digital representation of the mummy was created in Alias, featuring simulated muscles for much of the body attached to a skeleton. The animators controlled parts of the mummy via procedural animation. Animating the underlying bones, in turn, controlled the stretch and movement of the overlaid muscles. Finally, layered on top of the procedural animation and motion capture, was additional animation to tweak the performance. Given the limitations of the technology, subtle movements like facial or hand animations had to be done by hand. Shots that featured Vosloo with overlaid computer-generated prosthetics were the most difficult for the effects team, requiring careful match-moving. Rather than using a stunt performer, Vosloo performed the motion capture for the character himself. Scenes were blocked out and performed on set during principal photography, first with Vosloo in the scene, then without. The shots were then replicated in the motion capture studio, with Vosloo's performance recorded by eight cameras from different angles. In addition to The Mummy, the script called for numerous effects shots to magnify the sweeping adventure of the film. Vistas like a flashback shot of the ancient city of Thebes, combined location footage shot in the desert, with composited actors shot on green screen, model miniatures, map paintings and computer-generated effects. The plagues Imhotep unleashes were accomplished using particle-based computer physics, with ILM designers swapping out models of different qualities 
depending on how far from the camera the swarming insects were. While the film made extensive use of computer-generated imagery, many scenes, including one where Rachel Weisz's character is covered with rats and locusts, were shot using live animals. Another close-up shot used footage of anaesthetised locusts attached to a stunt performer, combined with extra computer-generated pests. Sandstorms used procedural graphics based on programmes used to create tornadoes in Twister, while the masses of flesh-eating scarabs used techniques developed for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. A shot of a firestorm engulfing Cairo combined real palm trees, physical models and map paintings with computer-generated hail, fire and rubble. Pacific title Mirage also enhanced shots with digital camera shake. The finale involves an army of mummies coming to Imhotep's defence. Many of these mummies were created by makeup effects supervisor Nick Dudman, who produced makeup, prosthetics and animatronic effects in the film. Each suit came with variations for stunt moves or pyrotechnics. After principal photography, the suits were sent to ILM to scan and be modelled in the computer. Using parts of the Imhotep mummy to save time, ILM recreated the underlings digitally to add into the scenes and used motion capture to animate them. The animators credited Fraser's ability to consistently reenact his movements in multiple takes as saving time when it came to match the motion capture digital mummies to the live action fight scenes. Section 4 Music. The score for The Mummy was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith, with orchestrations provided by Alexander Courage. Goldsmith had previously scored Deep Rising for Summers. As he reached the final few years of his career, Goldsmith was coming off a number of action and adventure films in the 90s, from multiple Star Trek films to Air Force One. Goldsmith provided the mummy with suitably bombastic music, with the traditional European orchestra supplemented with regional instruments, such as the bouzouki. The opening of the film contains nearly all of Goldsmith's major themes for the score, with what music critic Jeff Bond calls an Egyptian theme, reused in different configurations throughout to establish the epic settings and sense of place for Hamanaptra, a theme for Imhotep, or the mummy, that is performed in an understated manner early in the film before repeating in more forceful, brassy renditions after the mummy has regenerated, a love theme used for both Imhotep slash Anaxuna Moon and Rick slash Evelyn, and a heroic theme for Rick. In addition to the extensive brass and percussion instruments, the score uses sparing amounts of vocals, unusual for much of Goldsmith's work. The soundtrack was released by Decca Records on May the 4th, 1999. Overall, Goldsmith's score was well received. All Music described it as a grand, melodramatic score, which delivered the expected highlights. Other reviews positively noted the dark, percussive sound meshed well with the plot, as well as the raw power of the music. The limited but masterful use of the chorus was also lauded, and most critics found the final track on the CD to be the best overall. On the other hand, some critics found the score lacked cohesion, and that the constant heavy action lent itself to annoying repetition. Roderick Scott, of Cinemusic.net, summed up the score as representative of both Goldsmith's absolute best and his most mediocre. Thankfully, his favourable work on this release wins out. Section 5. Release Test audiences reacted poorly to the film's title, which conjured up negative impressions of an old horror film. But domestic marketing president Mark Schmuger recalled that they decided we would redefine the myth with the film, rather than change the title. Enthusiasm for the film was low, but Universal took out a television spot for the Super Bowl, reportedly costing $1.6 million, that Summers recalled immediately reversed the discussion of the film's prospects. 
The producers were concerned that the imminent release of The Phantom Menace would sink the film's box office fortunes, resulting in them moving the release date from May 21st to 7th. The Mummy grossed $43 million in 3,210 theatres in the United States and Canada on its opening weekend. Its weekend take was the highest non-holiday May opening and the ninth biggest of all time. The film later fell to second place behind The Phantom Menace. The Mummy grossed over $155.4 million in the United States and Canada and $261 million internationally, grossing over $416.4 million worldwide. The Mummy was released on home video in VHS and DVD formats in September 1999. The title was a tremendous success for Universal on home video, selling 7 million units on VHS and 1 million on DVD, making it the year's best-selling live-action VHS and second best-selling DVD behind The Matrix. The Mummy's performance helped Universal gross over $1 billion in home video sales. The film was later digitally remastered and received a Blu-ray release in 2008. Section 6. Critical Response The Mummy received mixed reviews from critics. On Rotten Tomatoes, the film holds an approval rating of 61%, based on 101 reviews, with an average rating of 5.9 out of 10. On Metacritic, the film has a score of 48 out of 100, based on 34 critics, indicating mixed or average reviews. Audiences polled by CinemaScore gave the film an average grade of B on an A plus to F scale. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film a positive review, writing, There is hardly a thing I can say in its favour, except that I was cheered by nearly every minute of it. I cannot argue for the script, the direction, the acting, or even the mummy, but I can say that I was not bored, and sometimes I was unreasonably pleased. Critics such as Entertainment Weekly's Owen Gleiberman and the New York Times' Stephen Holden concurred with the assessment of the film as a breezy crowd-pleaser. Less positively, Keith Phipps of the AV Club wrote that the film's attempt to create a big, Indiana Jones-inspired action film felt forced, and the end result was unsatisfying. Other reviews complained of an overstuffed plot or recycled elements from better movies. Reviewers comparing the film to the 1932 original sometimes favoured the original's focus on atmosphere and dread, though others welcomed the change to a more energetic Indiana Jones-type film. The effects were generally praised, especially to the title creature. Ernest Larson's review for Jump Cut felt that the effects were too similar to ILM's other work, and that the effects alone could not support the weight of the rest of the movie. Bob Graham of the San Francisco Chronicle and Hal Hinson from the Dallas Observer agreed that the effects never overshadowed the human aspects of the film. Gleiberman noted that the horrors of the effects were undercut by the light-heartedness of the film, while the BBC's Almar Hafliderson felt that the effects were occasionally unconvincing and the heavy reliance on cutting-edge computer-generated imagery would likely date the film heavily as time passed. Critics generally praised the acting, with Hafliderson writing that the efforts of the cast sold material that otherwise would have been cheesy. David Hunter of The Hollywood Reporter wrote that all the actors managed to hold their own amid the special effects, although he felt Vosloo was largely wasted after Imhotep regenerates, and the screenplay gives him little to do. Reviews from the USA Today, the British Film Institute and the AV Club noted the film featured questionable casting of ethnic roles and occasionally traded in stereotypes of Arabs. Writing to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the film's release, writer Maria Lewis noted that on paper The Mummy should not have been a success, as yet another period adventure film coming after a decade of failed period adventure films. Its connection with audiences, if not critics, was down to its successful blend of heart, humour, heroics and horror. She declared it the pivotal blockbuster of the 90s. 
Emma Stefanski, writing for Thrillist, noted that it was the beginning of the end for action-adventure films, as superhero films would soon supplant it in the coming years. Rotten Tomatoes called the film Indiana Jones for a New Generation. Reviewers noted Fraser's portrayal of Rick set a new mould for action heroes that more films would follow in the years after, while also considering Evelyn a character allowed to break free from a traditional damsel in distress role. Section 7. Adaptations The Mummy's box office performance led to numerous sequels and spin-offs. The film sequel The Mummy Returns, 2001, features most of the surviving principal characters. As a married couple, Rick and Evelyn confront Imhotep and the Scorpion King. The film also introduces the hero's son, Alex. A second sequel, The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, 2008, takes place in China, with the terracotta emperor inspiring the villain, and Rachel Weiss replaced with Maria Bello. The films inspired both an animated TV series titled The Mummy, which lasted two seasons, and the spin-off prequel, The Scorpion King, 2002. Universal announced plans in 2012 to reboot the franchise. A new film, also titled The Mummy, was released in June 2017. Developer Konami Nagoya published two video game adaptations of The Mummy under licence from Universal Interactive Studios in 2000. An action-adventure game for the PlayStation and Microsoft Windows developed by Rebellion Developments, as well as a Game Boy Color puzzle game. There was also a 2002 video game based on the 2001 animated series published by Ubisoft for Game Boy Advance. The film also inspired a roller coaster, Revenge of the Mummy, found in three Universal Studios theme parks, Hollywood, California, Orlando, Florida, and Sentosa, Singapore. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, available at creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by hyphen sa slash 3.0.